Let's look at some examples for question seven, the assessment of knowledge. Let's firstly take a look at some issues to do with how you work with open and solid uh, assessment types in terms of the boundary strength. And then let's tell what I take to be some very interesting stories about how assessment actually plays out. And we'll look at, uh, we'll look at examples from Finland, from the USA and from Japan. Uh, let's start off with the boundary strength story and I'd like to start off by talking about Finland and then juxtaposing Finland uh, to the USA because they have very different ways of operating with assessment. Now in Finland the first thing I'd like to mention about Finland is, is that it has the reputation more recently of being one of the most successful educational systems in the world uh, and this has to do with tests which they've done, international tests like PISA, which have shown their students to be doing exceptionally well. And what's fascinating about the Finnish example is, is that the assessment regime, the assessment program is radically open. Uh, they've got brilliant teachers, often their teachers, well the teachers have to have a master's in the subject that they're working with and this means they can trust the teachers to actually get on with it because the teachers are so well trained and educated and this means that they can have a very open, radically open uh, kind of uh, boundary system to do with assessment. So here's an account of how it works. Uh, assessment of both schools, learning outcomes and pupils is encouraging and supportive in nature. Uh, the aim is to produce information that will help schools and pupils to develop. There are no national tests of learning outcomes and no school league tables. Pupils and schools are not compared with each other. National assessments of learning outcomes are based on samples and the key function of assessment is to pinpoint areas requiring further improvement in different subjects and within the entire school system. And firstly what you can hear is the key role that feedback is playing in this story. The reason why you do assessment is to find out how the system is functioning and what you can do to improve the current functioning. It creates a feedback loop. But notice that the boundary strength of assessment, and by boundary strength we mean do you allow a number of possible options of assessment or do you just have one form of assessment? In this case it's clearly open. The school system as a whole is allowing the individual schools and the individual teachers to pursue their own type of assessment uh, in the hope uh, and the actual practice that the teachers will give the feedback that's best in the context to the student uh, at an individual level. So it's a fantastic system in terms of the way it works with the open boundary line. And yes, yeah, you can carry on with the account. I, I love the way they describe this. Assessment of study skills, working skills and behavior should be individual, truthful and versatile. And there's a great account of an open line. Uh, number one individual, so you have to focus on different individuals and do it differently for different individuals. But you have to stay truthful, and that's a great word. Uh, truthful to the person, truthful to the expectations of the system, uh, truthful to the interaction between the teacher and the student. And thirdly, it has to be versatile. And versatile is another word for an open boundary, which allows flexibility in how you're actually going to do the assessment based on the actual conditions allowed. Now, the, in America, we have a very different setup. Uh, now, you've got to bear in mind, firstly, that America is a far bigger system, and it's a federal system. It has many states which can do things differently. And there's been an attempt in America to make sure that at least the different states do come together in a way where some kind of testing is done to ensure that standards are reached. And this became known as the No Child Left Behind policy. Now what happened was that in 2001, uh, a, a law was passed. It was called the No Child Left Behind Act. And it's an astonishing attempt uh, to kind of use high stakes tests to drive the improvement of schools, teaching quality and student achievement. Now in brief, the law, as it was originally designed at least, mandates that each state develop learning standards 
and standardized tests to track school performance. Now in that term, standardized tests, you can hear a situation where you're closing down the assessment line to one test that everyone has to do. The tests are administered at multiple grade levels to measure how well students are meeting the standards. Now what was fascinating about this uh, law was that what they tried to do was they tried to ensure that the test results are tracked and reported separately for different subgroups of students, such as minority groups, and within minority groups identifying, for example, Hispanics and Blacks, and reporting separately for those groups. Students from low-income households, students with special needs, and students with limited proficiency in English. Now the hope was that by publicly reporting the test scores achieved by different schools and student groups, and then tying those scores to rewards if you do well, penalties if you do badly, and extra funding as you improve, the law aimed to improve schools deemed to be underperforming, as determined by the test scores, and close long-standing achievement gaps. Now you can hear in this uh, idea that, that what you're going to do is you're going to close down, you're going to solidify the assessment line, make sure that everyone within the state does the same test and then start to compare how different groups do in that test and force schools to actually improve the results of those doing the worst, especially if they come from uh, poor communities or especially if they come from minority groups. Mm. And I think it's a, it's a very interesting strategy and it's caused a lot of debate as to whether it works or not. So, so let's take a look at the debate and let's take a look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of high stakes testing. Now notice that with uh, high stakes testing, the first advantage is that you're holding teachers accountable for ensuring that all students learn what they are expected to learn. Uh, and I think that's an important situation in, 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 in a situation like America, where you had a lot of teachers allowed flexibility to do what they want. There was a situation where the, the good teachers were doing exceptionally well, but a lot of teachers who were not that good were actually getting by with doing minimal work. And here was the hope that you'd hold teachers accountable for it. And if the teachers actually don't succeed, they get given a couple of warnings to improve. And if they don't improve, they're basically in line for getting fired. It also motivates students to work harder, learn more, and take the tests more seriously. So you're establishing high expectations for both educators and students. And those high expectations can help reverse cycles of low educational attainment that have historically disadvantaged some student groups. And, and in America, as in a lot of the rest of the world, uh, minority groups and students from poor socioeconomic backgrounds have tended to perform worse uh, at school. And the idea is, is that what you do is you have a high expectation for these groups and that will force teachers, schools and the communities and the learners to all lift up to those high expectations. So it's a... It's a fascinating idea, and let me just give the last uh, advantage. It provides easily understandable information about schools and student performance in the form of numerical test scores. Because it's standardized, and because there's only one test provided for everyone, you can compare different schools, different communities, different minority groups, and you can start to name and shame. You can praise those that are doing well. You can punish those that are doing badly. And you can hear in this that there is a feedback loop. High stakes testing has a feedback loop. It has a situation where you take the information, you feed it back into the system, and you try and improve things. But notice this is a forced feedback loop. You use one assessment to drive the feedback mechanism to make sure that everyone is doing the same thing uh, but doing it properly. Now, the disadvantages of high stakes testing um, have been shouted from the rooftops uh, by various assorted communities. And the first one is that it forces educators to teach to the test. If you have one test, it's a solid line in terms of the test, everyone has to do it. What's going to happen is Teachers are going to teach to that test, especially if they know that their own future and the future of their schools is dependent on that result. 
So you, you promote a narrow academic program in schools. Uh, you're only going to focus on the key subjects. Anything else that's extra, anything else that's so-called fun, just gets eliminated, tossed away. Now, with this pressure, it, it does definitely contributes. May It says may contribute, but it definitely contributes to higher, even much higher rates of cheating amongst educators and students, including coordinated large-scale cheating schemes perpetrated uh, by school administrators and teachers who are looking to avoid the sanctions and the punishments that result from poor test performance. And this has happened across America, systematic cheating, where uh, teachers actually got hold of the exam uh, scripts and they actually used uh, rubbers to kind of rub erasers to rub out the wrong answers and fill in the right answers for the students. They often had teachers who would tell the students the right answers in the test itself and the kids who knew that certain teachers would cheat above other teachers would directly ask for those teachers to be a part of their uh, classes. And there were incredible situations where uh, kids that didn't write the test basically got full marks and teachers who didn't perform very well were mocked and shamed in the staff room because they were threatening the school itself. And this led to very um, high um, amounts of cheating throughout the educational system. Uh, and interestingly enough as well, these high stakes testing, uh, even though they're directed at minority groups, it's supposed to help minority groups. It's been correlated actually to increased failure rates, lower graduation rates and higher dropout rates for minority groups. And there's the sad reality that because you land up doing one kind of lesson with one kind of content uh, for the kids to make sure that they pass, lessons become boring. Uh, repetitive, dry, the kids lose interest and they drop out. Um, so there's actually a, a terrible uh, perverse consequence to the attempt to actually help uh, minority groups where in the process of helping them you sometimes ensure that they actually do badly. Now we've taken a look at how Finland has a radically open assessment system on the one side which allows for enormous variety and in America there's been an attempt to close down the assessment line uh, within the states through the no child left behind policy. But what I'd also like to do is I'd like to take a, a, a detailed look at how assessment and feedback work at the classroom level with teachers working with their students in the lessons themselves. And one of the most fascinating accounts of how you powerfully work with feedback in the actual lesson structure comes from Japan uh, and it's called lesson study. Now the way that it works is it's a professional development process that Japanese teachers engage in to systematically examine and improve their practice right, with the goal of becoming more effective. This examination of their practice centers on teachers working collaboratively on a small number of study lessons. Now these study lessons are key lessons, they're key areas which have been identified where they take students to not be doing well or key lessons which students really need to understand. And working on these study lessons involves planning, teaching, observing and critiquing the lessons. Okay, so what happens is to provide focus and direction to this work, the teachers select an overarching goal, which they work on and they decide on themselves, and a related research question they want to explore. They want to try and understand how it is that the learners actually understand something. So they're going to actually investigate how learners understand the topic. This research question then serves to guide their work on all the study lessons itself. Now, what happens is uh, the teachers, whilst working on the study lessons, they jointly draw up a detailed plan for the lesson, done collaboratively together. They work on what they take to be the best lesson that they can imagine. Uh, this has to be a lesson where the learners or the students do work. The learners have to show their understanding. They have to grapple with the task itself. And then what happens is one or two of the teachers teach the lesson in a real classroom as other group members observe the lesson. And then afterwards, the group then comes together to discuss their observations of the lesson. And they revise the lesson based on what they've seen. 
And after they've revised it, another teacher teaches it in a second classroom whilst the group members look at it again. And then they'll come together again to discuss the observed instruction. And finally, once they think they've got at the point where they've got the learners doing what they want to do in a creative and productive way, the teachers will produce a report of what their study lessons have taught them, particularly with respect to the research question, and they will set up a bunch of lessons which actually do work, which everyone has worked on collaboratively. But now here's the interesting point. After that lesson has been worked on and designed and all the materials have been perfected and all the responses from the learners have been uh, studied to ensure that the best response is given, that lesson then becomes a core lesson which all the teachers in that group teach. So weirdly, the initial phase is a radically open phase in terms of the selection, sequencing and pacing, where you try and work on things together in an open way. But once the lesson's formed, it becomes very much like one of Engelman's direct instruction lessons, where all the teachers then teach it according to the script of that lesson. So it makes for a fascinating dynamic on the one side between an open, democratic, engaged process where the teachers actually do professionally develop. And secondly, a situation where they then teach that lesson according to the script. And I think it speaks directly to the problematic direct instruction has with the fact that he takes away the designing of the lesson, the professional insight of the teachers into what should go into the lesson. Engelman takes that away. He takes it upon himself to do. Whereas over here, you skill up the teachers in the process itself. Uh, so you enable them to become the people who design really good lessons. Now... I just want to highlight uh, how the Japanese lesson study plan works, uh, just to show you directly how it works with the feedback cycle. Now, firstly, you work on the steps of the lesson and the learning activities and the key questions, and that's designed by the teachers together. And that's a full lesson with all the different materials that are needed to do the lesson itself. And what happens is, with the student activities, you give an account of what you expect the student reactions or responses to be. So you actually predict their response. You say, if we do this, we think they're going to react like that. And then once you work out that reaction, you then say the teacher should respond to the reaction of the students like this. So you can hear what they're trying to do is they're trying to get a sequence going in which they predict what the student will say and then what the teacher will say so that they can get a, a, a direct sequence going which does the job, which gets you to the end point. And then you have the methods of evaluation which make sure that the students have reached that end point. So you can hear in the setup that you have a very powerful feedback mechanism contained in the lesson program itself and this ensures that uh, the sequence which is initially radically open and explorative finally lands up in a situation where it closes down and eventually by the end of the process you have a scripted lesson which everyone has worked on rather than just one person who then insists that everyone has to teach it across the world.